bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. I'm going to uh, talk to you about the Newcomer Navigator Toolkit, uh, Strengthening Families for a Vibrant Future. And it's my pleasure to welcome once again, back to back, uh, our partners from the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario and the Ottawa Children's Treatment Centre. Uh, not by design that we had two uh, presentations in two weeks from them, but uh, just timely with some of the work, great work that's uh, coming out of that organization. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a program that CHEOOCTC created as a result of the Syrian Refugee Initiative that entail, entailed settling, resettling 2,000 newcomers to Ottawa, many of which were families with children and many required assistance navigating the pediatric health care system in Canada and that resulted in a toolkit that you can find at simplifyingthejourney.ca uh, it was, which uh, was just launched uh, maybe a month ago uh, to it in a great session I was able to join uh, our colleagues over at, uh, at CHEO uh, for, for the launch a uh, really great reception lots of families and children there to uh, to celebrate the launch of this great tool so it's our, it's our pleasure to share it with our audience today and it's my pleasure to introduce the team from CHEO OCTC to tell us a bit more about this program Program. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Christine Curry, who's the Manager for Patient Experience and is the Acting Chief Privacy Officer at CHEO OCTC. And Christine provides leadership to advance CHEO's uh, strategic direction of exceptional patient and family experiences, which includes in her portfolio patient relations, multiculturalism and interpretation services, French language services, spiritual support, and family and patient engagement strategies. Uh, we also have Sulana Taha, who's a, a newcomer navigator for the Department, Department of Patient Experience. And uh, Sulana has a keen interest in cultural competency and advocacy for newcomers. She, in her current role, provides support for patients and families who require integration into the Canadian healthcare system. And last but not least, of course, we have Dr. Sahar uh, Zoni, who's uh, the program manager currently for the Solutions for Patient Safety program at CHEO OCTC in the Quality and Safety Department. But prior to that, she was the project manager for the Newcomer Navigator uh, toolkit project at the patient experience department. So uh, without any further ado, it's our pleasure to hand the virtual podium uh, over to our team from CHEO OCTC. Hey, thanks very much, Doug. It's, uh, hi, it's Christine speaking. We're going to speak in sequence, but uh, hopefully you'll we'll keep track of your questions, so feel free to uh, put them in that chat box, and Doug has promised he'll relay them to us. Um, so what we wanted to do, uh, we thought would really nicely set the tone for this session, is actually feature a video from the toolkit, um, which features some of our lovely families that we've gotten to know through this uh, work as well. So I'll hand it back to Doug just to show the video. In late 2015, the Government of Canada announced a plan to resettle 25,000 Syrian refugees. Settlement agencies identified that many of these newcomer families expected in the Ottawa area included children with complex medical needs. Being a children's hospital in the nation's capital, Chia was accustomed to dealing with newcomers, just not in the overwhelming numbers that began to appear. Well, I would really say it was business as usual uh, prior to the Syrian refugees arriving. Uh, we have a dedicated certain number of individuals who are considered bilingual. We have um, translators to meet the needs of different languages, but we did not have a dedicated individual aligned with uh, meeting newcomers to Ottawa. 
On January 6, 2016, the first six Syrian refugee families arrived in CHIO's emergency department. It was immediately apparent that CHIO needed to do more than simply treat these young patients and send them back to their new homes. CHIO also needed to not only help these newcomer families understand their new world, but also help staff and physicians understand the world these families had come from. My name is Gerardo Quintanar. I am the manager of spiritual support, uh, multiculturalism and interpretation services at CHIO. Khalid and Jihan El Balke came to Ottawa from a refugee camp in Jordan. The family home is Dara. There are five children in the family. The two oldest are Sedra and Kinan. The two youngest are Rayan and Hassan. The CHIO Newcomer Navigator Program helps the El Balke family with interpretation and coordination of care between CHIO clinics and the Ottawa Children's Treatment Centre. The middle child, Isan, has global developmental delay with impaired mobility. She depends on a wheelchair. What is very interesting is through the development of that role of the navigator, that we start to realize that we were doing a so-so job with other newcomers as well. So I think the Syrians opened the eyes to us in terms of the reality the newcomers face in coming into Canada into the health system. So it was clear from the get-go that we will be focused in this crisis situation on the Syrians, but immediately we realized that we need a newcomer navigator. The Nakar family left their home in Aleppo for a refugee camp in Turkey before coming to Ottawa. The CHIO newcomer navigator helps with interpretation services and coordinating care between the hospital and the Ottawa Children's Treatment Center. The oldest child, Walid, was diagnosed with global developmental delay and cerebral palsy. We need somebody there to assess the whole process of these families during the length of a stay. The follow-up afterwards, when they go home or when they go to, back to the hotel or to the Sophia house, the reception house, and we need a follow-up to, to these families as well. We need somebody who speaks Arabic, who was familiar uh, with the systems in the hospital to do that kind of ongoing mediation. Mahmoud Barho and Hanan El Jassim brought their family, Janed, Aya, Zayan, and Ahmed, from Aleppo to the safety and security of Ottawa. When they arrived, Zion suffered from chronic renal failure and required peritoneal dialysis. The CHIO Newcomer Navigator Program ensured interpretation services were available at key meetings. In particular, those that equipped mom and dad with the skills and equipment to manage Zion's dialysis at home. The Navigator ensured the CHIO team members were aware of his cultural needs and that his care plan made the best use of community supports for newcomers, such as their settlement worker. Sadly, Zion passed away in October 2017. These families, and hundreds more, unearthed the need for more than just interpretation services. It was apparent that CHIO needed to offer more comprehensive assistance to Syrians, but also to all newcomers to help these families navigate the complexity of Canadian healthcare, including hospital and community-based services. So what we wanted to cover now um, is for this agenda is I just want to briefly, I think most people are aware of CHEO, so I'll very briefly go through that. Just talk about generally where does this fall within our health equity framework that we have at CHEO. Um, then I'll hand it over to Sulana to talk about her experience actually in, in uh, putting feet to the ground and developing the navigator position with us. And then uh, I'll hand over to Sahar to talk about the toolkit and certainly as I said we'd love to hear comments and questions for sure. So I think people are aware, you know, like uh, other we're an academic pediatric facility, acute care. We recently amalgamated with uh, the Ottawa Children's Treatment Center, so we also have those additional services under one umbrella. Um, and we're one of the busiest emergencies. I think we're the second busiest emerge pediatric emerge across Canada. A bit unique to us is our multi-provincial um, uh, service 
uh, catchment area. So we have Eastern Ontario, some of Northern Ontario, but we also have the contract to provide medical and surgical services to Nunavut. And uh, we also cover Western Quebec. So we see about 15% of our clientele is from actually from Quebec. So health equity is certainly not a new concept. Um, this is just a quote from Martin Luther King who really highlighted back in the 60s how really healthcare and equity in healthcare really is a barometer for your societal values and, and really should, we should be shocked um, if we see that healthcare is, is uh, not provided to all. This is, um, I think this visual which has gone a bit viral on social media kind of represents our philosophy at CHEO on, on health care and equity. So if you look at the image on the left, you know, if we provide equal service, every provider speaks English or maybe even English and French, um, then you're still not going to meet the needs of all your patients and families. We know that, you know, there are different issues for every family that arise and that middle image kind of approaches what we try generally, I think, across all of the pediatric hospitals and organizations that, you know, you try to have things for building blocks for families. What do they need to be able to participate in healthcare in an equitable fashion? So it may be an interpreter. It may be that um, the parents have anxiety. So we're adapting our approach so we speak slower and try to keep a quieter environment. So it may be um, hearing impairment. So we have a sign language interpreter and those kind of things. What we've found, I mean, and ultimately on the right is the ideal system where you, where everybody feels like they're an equal uh, player at the, the game. You can see we still have the fence because we're pediatric healthcare. We don't want anybody hit by a ball, but we hope that everybody just doesn't feel like they need to be accommodated, that they feel like they they can come in and get equal service. And that's what we hope our navigational um, as one strategy would be to remove the, the, the solid fence and have it be more of just that uh, chain link fence. Um, but really, I would say the that's your ultimate goal. Your navigator position is really going to be key in identifying what are those things that are those barriers to them being an equitable force. And that's what we've found over t the past couple of years is that in Sulana's work, that's, she can really identify, hey guys, you think you're doing this well, but here's where your shortcomings are. So I'm going to hand it over to Sulana, speaking of which, and she's going to go over um, kind of where did we start and where did we come to. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. So we're going to talk a little bit about day one, which was uh, December 2015 in the emergency department, when we had a group of newcomers come through our doors and all clearly looking like anxious and nervous and confused as not knowing what's going to happen next. Um, we did lack interpretation, we did lack understanding of um, how we can help these newcomers culturally. They did have lack of understanding of their health status, um, lack of community resources, and lack of cultural support. So basically, it was a clear view of that we were not ready. And from that day forward, we knew that we had to make a change at CHEO. So from January to March 2016, we had a surge of Syrian refugee children come through our doors, with many with complex and long-standing health issues. Ultimately, 100% interpretation needed neither of which spoke even French. So Arabic was their only language and we needed an interpreter basically for every single family that came through our doors. We lacked staff awareness of the culture and language. We even had staff who didn't even know where Syria was on the map. So education was very much key. It was an added social distress secondary to settlement issues. At that point, our families felt like they were isolated from everyone else in the hospital just because of a language barrier. So then we, we had CHEO solution of a newcomer navigator, someone who can internally give an assessment of the needs for these refugees. And this is where we started with this CHEO refugee response committee with staff, nurses, directors, management, helping us determine how we can help these families and patients establish and integrate better into CHEO. Basically someone to help families integrate into a new healthcare system and navigate through our hospital. Because as you can believe that Syria, their hospital system is way much more different than ours. Then we had our external linkage with Refugees 2.3, and this is all the community members in the community of Ottawa helping together, working together efficiently in establishing how we can help the entire population coming to Ottawa. 
Then we had our internal role development. So patient experience team lead, that's us, and organizational support with the executive team. From there, we had our internal six-month support from the ministry, and that's how we basically launched, was with that six-month support and how we can do things more better, how can we be more efficient, how can we, what are the documents that are more key and important for us to translate for families, how can we educate families, and how can we educate our staff. Then we come forward to the Navigator key functions. So referral system for the navigation support, that really started with the emergency department where we had um, our clerks basically put information for the physicians on how we could connect with the navigator. And it would ultimately come back to me and see how I can support the families by providing settlement support, by providing a family doctor, or just follow up. The cultural consultation service is just connecting with families and seeing how they felt accepted at CHEO and then determining how much support and education and information sessions we can provide our staff for them to understand the Syrian culture. And that's where it comes to the cultural competency training. We would have worldview vision uh, sessions. We would have sessions for nurses. We would have sessions for physicians. We would have sessions for clerks. Then we'd have the ex external linkages, connecting families to their settlement worker who they already may have met and not even aware that that is their settlement worker. Then it comes to our statistics. So just Syrian <laughs> refugee children, we're looking up to 2,500 in our catchment area. We prioritize the illnesses of children, many with high complex health care needs and physical disabilities. OCTC was already waitlisted within the Eastern um, Ontario catchment. We'd had to, we had to basically strategize a separate list just to help our Syrian refugees. In 2016, CHIO welcomed 236 refugees. 765 had outpatient appointments, 250 emergency visits, and 60 inpatient admissions. What is not included in there is that we had, as well, two admissions to ICU. Then we talk about our evaluation metrics. The usage of our, our health care, the length of stay, the emergency visits, no-show rates for booking appointments. We had to determine why was our no-show rates. Was it an interpretation thing? Was it a lack of understanding? Was it a lack of connecting with families from their, from their family doctor? What was it really that was preventing these families from no-show? Were they scared to come to CHEO? Did they feel uncomfortable and unaccepted? Then there was an experience survey. The overall experience at CHEO, did families feel safe? Did they feel isolated? Did they feel secluded? Then we talked about our interpretation experience. Were our interpreters doing a good job? Did we need more interpreters? Did we need more female interpreters for our female patients? Did we need more male interpreters? Did we need more interpreters who were Syrian, who had a Syrian background? And then the survey went forward to the navigator experience. How did families feel about me? How did I feel about families? And what more can we do to make them feel comfortable and integrated into our healthcare system? The current status of the new normal. We basically have a refugee in our department every day. Expansion of the role to all newcomers. At first we were just helping Syrian refugees. Now we're helping families from Burundi, Djibouti, Somalia, Afghanistan. We've even seen refugees from the United States of America. We've continued education internally. We are constantly trying to educate staff. It's really nice to receive emails from staff asking questions. By example, I had a family come in. I'm not sure how I communicate with them. What do you think about this? Maintaining and expanding external partnership so we still connect with our settlement agencies and we still connect, we still keep that partnership. Budget implications. The, the navigator, interpretation, we've definitely gone over interpretation budget. And equity supports. And equity supports we can use that we can talk about spiritual support, providing spiritual and cultural support for families 24-7. And sharing our knowledge and successes. What have we learned and what can we provide that lesson to other community members and other community services and resources outside of the city. So now I'm going to hand it over to Sahar, who's going to talk to you more about Simplify the Journey. Thank you. Thank you, Solana, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I would like to give you a very highlight on the website, Simplifying the Journey. 
uh, which was created by CHEO, and the whole project was funded by the Employment Social Development Canada and highly supported by our by uh, Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada. So we're really very thankful to those two organizations. Uh, the website, as you can see, contains uh, the Newcomer Navigator Toolkit, and it also shares the CHEO experience about welcoming our Syrian refugees as they came in. And what the staff felt and how we reacted and how we improved along the time. It also has a lot of videos that our families are um, telling their stories through and sharing their like um, very, very impressive stories of courage and resilience. And lots of resources there for organizations that can be used by them as they are thinking of implementing the Newcomer Navigator program. Uh, so how did this project start? In early 2017, which was almost after a year uh, of two having the Newcomer Navigator program uh, implemented, the government thought that CHU was doing um, a good job in settling uh, the newcomers to Ottawa and asked CHU to develop this uh, toolkit uh, which would help other organizations. It doesn't have to be healthcare, it can be any organization as they settle um, newcomers to uh, their catchment areas. Uh, the concept of navigation is not new, as you might all know. So it started in the early 1970s when Dr. Harold Freeman, uh, he studied um, the, concept, the correlation between poverty, uh, poor communication, ethnicity, and the early diagnosis treatment and the five-year survivorship of the cancer patients. Uh, his study showed that the survivorship for this population was around 30%. Later on, when he implemented the, new, the uh, Navigator program for the uh, cancer patients, this survivorship improved to reach 70%, showing that the patient navigation program really assists families uh, and patients in timely diagnosis and treatment, which is a significant factor in this remarkable improvement in survivability. So it all started um, in New York by the program by uh, Dr. Harold, and it expanded uh, across the healthcare organizations since then to not only include patients who had uh, cancer, but it went further to patients who had chronic diseases as diabetes and HIV. In Canada, in, um, the Nova Scotia was the first province in 2001 to have a cancer navigation program. And the report on this program in 2005 uh, noted that the program has significantly benefited the cancer patients and their families in dealing with the emotional, the informational needs, and the logistical challenges associated with having cancer. It also resulted in a more efficient use of the clinical time for physicians and more appropriate use of community health professionals. The program has contributed to overall improvements in the cancer care system itself by addressing problems related to integration, to coordination, and continuity of care. So it was concluded that uh, this type of programs that uh, we had implemented for patient navigation was very, very powerful. Patient navigation has since, programs have since expanded in Canada to also include patients who had chronic diseases. Uh, chronic diseases. Um, we also have now in Canada new programs that are more uh, towards certain populations as the Chinese, the South Asian, the Canadians, uh, and uh, the First Nation people. And you can find on the website lots of links to these different programs. So what were our objectives when we were creating the Newcomer Navigator Toolkit? First, it was actually to um, share our knowledge of the Newcomer Navigator what opportunities were there, what barriers, challenges these populations face, and us as an organization, what were our challenges in providing services, services to these refugee newcomers? 
in coordination, doing continuity of care, the language barriers, how did we overcome all these by having the newcomer navigator? Second, it was also to encourage other organizations outside the healthcare, um, one providing legal services, social services, settlement, educational services, who are helping these newcomers as they come into the country to implement the newcomer navigator in their organizations and to simplify the journey of settlement for these populations. We are trying by this to help organizations to actually be reactive in the response instead of being um, uh, active. So this infographic shows uh, the toolkit um, and it's, it's a very, it's a very um, uh, highlight, um, gives you a very highlight on the toolkit and its components. And the toolkit really first starts with the assessment, uh, assessment stage, which we call the five-step decision toolkit. And uh, then you move on to the design and planning for having the newcomer navigator, where you look at your internal processes inside the organization, and you do a, a, a communication plan that will end in implementing the program. And then looking at a continuous evaluation process and outcome data to look at where can you do better, which more which resources are needed more, and adding to that and uh, uh, reorganizing uh, the the program. The first part, which is the assessment part, which we call the five-step decision tool, is really very important because it will help the organization decide what's the size of the problem. So do a problem analysis, see which population you're serving in your catchment area, and then what are the services that are already um, supplied by the organization? What are the uh, um, services inside the outside in the community? And how can we stop duplications? And how can we uh, work together to give the best services uh, to this uh, population? Look at the budget and how can we um, afford to uh, have all the components of the program implemented. Look at the internal and external resources mapping inside the organization and then do an accountability um, uh, resource. Uh, uh, and this infographic also shows the different roles of a navigator inside the organization and it could differ from one organization to the other, but usually the core function of navigation is actually to eliminate all the barriers uh, to a timely care across all segments of the services given, healthcare, legal, whatever the continuum we're working on. And this function is mostly effective, uh, effectively carried out through a one-to-one -one relationship between the navigator and the families whether then this is what we usually feel it, it's getting best done in the healthcare sector. As we all know, in the healthcare sector, usually the pathway for guided healthcare includes a coordination and culturally appropriate care that is patient-centered and timely effective. So navigation can really help with this pathway guided care. And in our experience in CHEO, what we found and Solana referred to in doing an, our evaluation, we found that through doing the family satisfaction survey that we conducted with our Syrian refugee families, and we really did it over the phone by calling all the families we had on our list, this showed that 95% uh, of them were satisfied with our interpretation services, and 93% of them felt they were better prepared for their healthcare journey by having the information and education that was supplied through the Navigator program about their children's diseases. And um, interviewing our staff, which also shows the value of having the Newcomer Navigator program, uh, they uh, told us how they felt more confident providing culturally sensitive services to these families. And most, uh, most important, they felt supported. They felt there was someone there they can go to uh, and talk about 
their feelings about these families as they were come, welcome them, the differences they find, and um, they value, valued this cultural education that came through the program. And uh, interviewing our external partners, our partners in the community, whether settlement agents, other community healthcare services uh, centers, um, the feedback we got was they were strengthened by having the program and they felt that there was a person, a single focus point that they can go to who coordinates the care of these families and they can always refer to um, this, this focus person, the program in, in CHEO and OCTC to better help um, these families. Our leaders at CHEO felt that and are still hoping that through the Navigator program, they will continue to gather the evidence about the barriers and the challenges that these newcomers face uh, and be able to always make the in informed decisions when it comes to services that these families and, uh, families and need. We have to remember, and this is what we actually did at CHEO and focused on, that these families come from a totally different experience than what we are asking them to uh, integrate in. So here you can see how these families have faced a lot. And the Syrian refugees, when they came to us, they came actually from camps and have been living there for maybe two years before they came to Canada, to settle in Canada. And in doing so, we tried to you to change this, to integrate these families and make them feel they are part of our CHEO um, culture. And now we have families, Syrian refugee families, they are advocating for our new hospital here at, um, uh, in Ottawa. And um, we have them presenting at our CHEO family forum and they were part of our patient family engagement workshops that was held by the patient family engagement uh, committee, steering committee that's now working on a new strategy for family, patient family engagement at CHEO. Uh, during our launch event of the website, which took place on November the 10th, we were very impressed by the support we had from the government and the whole community. And our families shared this important launch event. And as you can see, the media were actually interviewing our kids and not others. <laughs> so the important question is, Healthcare is really the sector where most of the navigation programs have shown success. And the question comes to mind, uh, what about other sectors? Would it be successful in doing so? Uh, we are hoping that by implementing this toolkit that uh, other organizations can help these newcomers as they come in, and we believe that this can give value to their settlement as they come in. We would like to thank all the organizations that helped us, our community partners, and of course, CAFC for giving us this opportunity to share our experience, our families, our leadership at CHEO and OCTC. And we encourage you to um, visit our website and give us your feedback. There, is, there are links there on the website. Please contact us. And uh, we would also like to hear from you using the Twitter uh, and using the hashtag Newcomer Navigator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great presentation. And as I said, I was uh, I was able to be at that uh, that launch event, and you, you're absolutely right about the interest from uh, the politicians and the media. I think there were at least uh, two, or if not three, uh, of the, the the major Canadian media outlets filming there, and everything. It was certainly great and in, 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 in intense interest in this program. So, so congratulations to you all. Um, so that's a reminder to the audience, if you do have any questions, uh, please type them into the question box and we'll uh, bring them into this discussion. Uh, the first question that came in was around, um, so you mentioned during the launch event that the media was interested in interviewing the children and hearing their stories. Uh, when you were going through this program and the whole process of sort of engaging families as you were developing the program, did, 
did you hear anything different from the children, the, the children of these refugee families versus their parents as far as what their needs? Is, is, are there any key messages that came from the, specifically from the children's perspective that sort of informed the program, or was it just more holistically the needs of the family at large that were sort of incorporated? It was more holistically the needs of the family. Um, the parents were more ultimately more concerned about them going to school. So first, them being well and then going to school because ultimately if they go to school, they're the new beginning of their family. It's a fresh start, right? These are the children who are going to take care of their parents when they're much older. Um, as for the children, they seem to be very happy and content to the care that they're receiving from CHEO. And it was, to them, the major need was school and making friends. Yeah. I have a lot of young boys who was making friends and playing soccer. That was number <laughs> one, is playing soccer. That is the, the biggest deal for them. <laughs> The kids are incredibly resilient, and as they went, to, at first, the ones who were the early newcomers were disappointed they couldn't go to school right away, but once they're in school, they're just like little sponges. They pick up English or French so easily, and, and they would amaze us, and that's why you could see them even, you know, the confidence they have is incredible. Like, talking to a reporter seemed like nothing to them versus our staff were like, oh, my God, a reporter wants to ask us a question. They're like, yeah, I'll tell you about my experience. Uh, they're just, uh, it's just a whole other world that people know on this, this you know, within CAFC. Kids are incredibly resilient and uh, awe-inspiring. That's a great, uh, great story about the kids. For, for sure, definitely they are the, the more resilient uh, when the families come over, for sure. They, they never fail to surprise us. Um, Karen has a question here. She says, you spoke about uh, cultural competence education. Uh, can you tell us more about the engagement of of MDs or physicians, and how long was their education in comparison to nurses, for example, or, or other healthcare providers? And did you create some sort of online module for staff to refer back to? So unfortunately, we have not created an online module yet for staff. It is definitely something that we'd love to do. Um, I Just before this presentation, I was currently in a physician presentation talking about culture and cultural competency. And it is basically an hour session where we sit and we talk about the culture of Syria. We talk just a little bit of the war. We don't really get into that often. Um, we talk about the demographics, the religions that are in Syria. We talk about how their hospitals work. And then we talk about the language and how the parents, how they associate in the families, like their roles, how the role of the mother is different than the role of the father and how the role of the child is different than the eldest and the youngest. Everyone has a different role. And so our goal is to help these physicians and nurses, clerks, managers, everyone in this hospital to properly address the need for a patient, properly introduce themselves. If you introduce yourself with your hands in your pocket in a closed, um, closed fist, families are going to take that differently. You have to understand how to approach a family. As you have your own culture, everyone has their culture. So you have to remember that everybody's culture is different. So our goal is to provide an hour to nurses, to physicians, and now we are currently for the new year going to try to do that all over again just as an update. So what we did was we had some broad, anybody could come lunch and learns, and we really got a broad spectrum. It was nice to see that we got from clerks to physicians to nurses to OTs, PTs, uh, social works, um, and so we did a general session for all staff, and that's, we call those our worldview sessions. So every month we hold one of these and we try and target different, whatever we think is our hot topics at the hospital that we're hearing through our patient experience department. And then as uh, Susanna said, we did some additional either by request or by suggestion. <laughs> if we were hearing themes in an area, they would say, hey guys, we really need to come and present to you. And our staff were actually very open to that. And so Susanna would go up, for instance, to their inpatient medical, medical unit and do a session for the nurses. So, I mean, ultimately, it'd be great to have something online where people could log in. It's, you know, hit and miss. Staff feel like there's these mandatory things that we have to do online. But, and it doesn't, of course, the, the other part is that um, you don't get that interactive, which was interesting. People were sometimes shy to, to be appear ignorant. So once they would see Selena present and get to know her and see it's, it's a safe space to say, like, why? I think these parents are fine. The dad's wearing a suit. And we could say, well, do you realize that's the only piece of clothing he currently has? And in their culture, you're going to dress up to come into a hospital. So having that safe space as well to do those questions is, is really valuable as well, which you wouldn't get through an online mode. All right. 
Um, Jana has a question uh, about uh, cultural safety. She's saying, beyond cultural competence, was there an exploration of cultural safety and implementing it at a policy slash procedural level to remove systemic barriers? And if yes, uh, how did it go? And if no, uh, why not? And, and maybe if you can, uh, maybe you could provide some clarification for some in the audience who may not be exactly clear, you know, maybe the difference between cultural competence and cultural safety. So the difference between cultural competence and cultural safety, I'll give you an example in the emergency department. For any parent, it doesn't matter if you're a refugee or a landed immigrant or someone who's born in Ottawa, it doesn't matter. When you bring your child to the emergency department, any parent can be anxious and nervous. Um, myself, I'm not a parent, but I've seen parents come in crying and they're upset and they're not sure what's going to happen to their child. So when it comes to cultural safety, we have parents who've forcefully gone up to nurses face to face and said, take care of my child now, right? A nurse sees that as a threat and immediately goes into shutdown mode and doesn't comprehend anything that the parent is looking for. Now they're just worried about their safety. But in a cultural com uh, perspective, this is a father who's come from a war-torn country, right, who had no medical care. But in the culture, the children are number one, right? Their health is the key of their culture. It is the key aspect. When our families come to Chio, they don't care about anything else but the, ch the health of their child. Especially when I had a gentleman come in, forced himself into triage with his son, screamed and yelled at the nurse. Of course, it's unacceptable, but it seemed like he was screaming and yelling, but he was actually talking. But mm -hmm. it's a culture thing. Some people are louder than others. In some culture, people tend to whisper. In other cultures, people tend to yell. And immediately, our code button went off mm -hmm. for someone to help her. Unfortunately, she closed off right away. For her, it was a safety thing. For him, he was just scared. But it seemed like he was yelling, but he wasn't yelling. And all it was was just a little paper cut on the forehead. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it differs. So I think that Suzanne has highlighted that cultural safety, we, we tend not to think of our hospitals as having their own culture, but we definitely do, right? And we know it's primarily our middle class, a white society and we set a culture. We know when you start at a new hospital you get a sense of that culture. So there's a cultural safety from our perspective and as well from the family. Do they feel free to come forward? It was interesting when we had the launch, um, one of the parents actually approached our CEO and his, that was Diane's uh, father who and Diane had just, just passed away. Um, that was one of our quandaries during the launch was to say, wow, how, and we asked Suzanne, how do we approach this? We've invited this family to the launch and now their child has just passed away. And so she was, a, we were able to talk with the family and get their sense of their wishes. So he wanted to come, so he did. Um, and so, but at the beginning, he firmly let our CEO know, I want to talk to you after this. I have some concerns. And we're like, oh, okay. So and meanwhile, we had the media coming, so a bit of anxiety on our end. Um, but we did facilitate the meeting, grabbed one of our interpreters and had the meeting right after the launch. And he was able to express uh, to Alex, Munter, our CEO, that in, his concerns were not about the care. He felt the care that Allah had decided when his child would die. So it was really out of everybody's hands. Um, but he was really upset at our weights and emerge. So you really need to address the weights and emerge because in my country before the, the war, you didn't wait. You walked in, my child had kidney disease, and I saw a nephrologist right there. And we know from our perspective that doesn't work in Canada. That's where our system, but it was this very lovely dialogue. But this ultimately to show he felt safe culturally to even come forward to our CEO is, shows you the length of uh, their level of safety. And then when we had Boosie, I had her join. She's one of our family advisors now and is participating on our patient engagement steering committee. And, and in the new year, we another family is going to join our family advisory committee. So if you don't create that cultural safety, you'll never get the engagement. And that's what we really need. And that's what I mean about systemic barriers. That's a bit of our gauge on are they feeling safe? Would they come and even participate in this forum of all these other families around the table? be one of our faculty members, that's really going to be a, a, a keen gauge for you on do they feel safe. I would say that our Syrian refugees feel safe, our Indigenous families don't feel safe at CHEO. So we know that's our working point to focus on. Maybe that helps answer that question. I'm not sure if there's a follow-up question. 
Yeah, definitely. If there is a follow follow up, uh, Jana, please don't uh, hesitate to type that in, and we'll get to it. But uh, you mentioned First Nations. So early in the presentation, you did say that this started off with the Syrian refugees, and it's since been you you you've started to uh, provide services, uh, navigation services for all sorts of people from other countries. And you mentioned First Nations. Have you? Have you included them in this program? Like you, you mentioned that there's still it still poses a challenge as far as their perception of being culturally safe in in, in the Canadian healthcare system. Is are they are they going to be incorporated into the program? Have you incorporated them? Is, are there lessons learned that makes it different than, of course, refugees that you can share with us? Mm, it's a very different approach. I would say we've been trying to have an, an Inuit navigator because we have that contract with none of it. We've been trying to get an Inuit navigator um, going for almost two years now. And so we're working with um, with the government, with funding. But with that one, it's very important that uh, it's different that the refugees are here. There's not, there wasn't existing partners in the community. So we just winged it with those who were also struggling to resettle the refugees and we just made this immediate partnership and just worked forward. Versus our indigenous um, population would say, we were here long before you, reminder to all of us, and you need to come to us and go through our process. So that's what we're doing. It's taking longer, but we want to do it right. And, and I've tried to rush that a bit just because I, you know, our, our kind of uh, white Anglo-Saxon, let's get this done, where are the timelines and let's meet our objectives and there you know, you'll have simple things like somebody wants to partner and they'll say, no, what? first I need to meet you in person and get to know you as a person and feel if you're safe and then I will have that dialogue. So it's it's a different process for sure. Our goal is to have an uh, either an Indigenous navigator or it might be an Inuit navigator separate from an Aboriginal or First Nations uh, navigator, but that's our ultimate goal. But yeah, it's a different process for sure. Um, the question that came in earlier was um, when you talked about interpretation services uh, as being an issue, and that was one of the things that you ramped up and took a lot of feedback on, were you also, in addition to interpretation services, were you able to provide translated documents to patients and families, pamphlets or any other sort of material, supplementary materials that may otherwise be handed out in English or French, were you able to provide translated versions of documents? Yeah, exactly, we did. Um, we. Uh, about uh, four or five years ago, we had a little bit of funding. I, I finagled from our foundation and did some what we identified as key documents. So we did those. Um, we then, from you know, things change over time. You have updates and you have new issues that arise. Um, so you might have had SARS. Well, it's now MERS that you need to have, you know, on your sheet, etc. So we did. Uh, we had some of that initial funding from the Ministry of Health through our LIN to give us our six months of just come and here's some money, fix it. Um, so we used some of that. And then I went to our foundation again, and they the, actually the outreach from the Muslim community in Ottawa has been tremendous in terms of tell us what we can do to help you, Chio, and we will do it. And so they've just stepped up to the plate. And so we were able to get more funding to do additional documents. So right now we're just re-inventorying because, of course, you know, I don't, speak or read Arabic and so we sent this out to a local um, interpretation provider. They do interpreters and translation and then we've come to realize the quality actually isn't as high as we'd hoped. So we're do actually doing a re-review of all those documents to make sure they're up to par because you'd hate to have a document of course have an error in it and, and so we had trusted that it was, you know, it was a professional organization and so that would be my caution to people engage with families who are literate and uh, that feel like they can partner with you and really provide, you know, feedback on your documents if you do that. That's been our learning point. So actually, Sahar uh, reads Arabic, thankfully, so she's doing an inventory of our and review of our sheets. Uh, I will just add to that um, that some of our uh, on the website, like we shared some of our documents, and some of that is translated so into Arabic, and that's revised. Yeah. So if organizations yeah. are thinking of having the Newcomer Navigator uh, program implemented, we have some resources that we shared. We have translated into English, uh, Arabic, uh, into English, sorry, from English to French and uh, Arabic, and we're hoping to have other languages too on the website. So check that, please. For us, um, when we look at our interpretation statistics, 80% of our interpretation, uh, if you don't speak English or French, 80% are Arabic speaking. 
so we are just about out of questions. That is my, my sort of last call to the audience. If you do have any last questions, please do type them in. We did have one uh, comment from Jana who was asking the question earlier about the the uh, the, the cultural safety uh, discussion. Um, so she just wanted to she wanted to thank you for for your feedback on that whole uh, issue and, and clarify clarification, etc. She she just wanted to comment and says uh, I understand cultural safety to mean that service providers are aware of the power and privilege they embody as a part of a larger institution that may or may not align with the paradigm of the patient and patient's families. Uh, in the example provided with the nurse, cultural safety would mean she is aware of the hospital's expectation of parent behavior, the value we put on it, and how we react to it, thus hopefully reducing the systemic barrier of marginalized patients being misunderstood or stigmatized. Um, so just, just an interesting sort of concept or a conversation around that whole issue of cultural safety and what our organizations can do uh, to address that or, and, and at least understand the impact of it. Yeah, there's definitely a power position, right? We don't feel that. Often I'll, I'll hear that from staff. It's like, well, you know, I'm at the whim of parents or I have to do everything parents say. And, and in fact, we're very much viewed that we have a power position and we need to be conscious of that. Um, we sometimes as staff feel very vulnerable. Oh, they're going to complain about me and what does that mean to my employment or or my feedback? And, and we need to realize the position of power we have to families, all families, not just you know, Syrian refugees or our indigenous population, but all families tell me how they feel vulnerable to us and, and are they safe to really express when they're feeling they don't understand information or your approach isn't make me feel safe as a family. I don't feel like I can speak up. So absolutely agree with that comment. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's all we have uh, for today from the audience and from the questions. So thanks for that discussion. So maybe we'll just wrap it up with uh, some closing comments from from the three of you, and I'll let you you guys uh, talk, discuss amongst yourselves if, whether all three of you want to want to want to close off with sort of a key message or anything. But maybe you, you could start with where uh, we can find more information. Obviously, the Simplifying the Journey uh, website is all of the information you're talking about here available on there. Like sort of basically, for a, an organization that wanted to implement a similar program, would they be able to find pretty much everything they need on that website? Yeah, everything is there. Um, we do. We did have a request uh, from another group. Um, we presented to uh, settlement agencies across Canada earlier this week, and they were requesting that we put on our external website as well the additional documents in Arabic once they're available. So that's our plan to do that as well. So you can check the CHEO website. It's chio.on.ca. That's a pretty easy one. Um, yeah. Any other closing comments? No, I've got a thumbs up. No, I don't think so, but feel free. I think um, Sahar's uh, email is on that slide that's up mm -hmm. currently. And so feel free to email questions, and she's kind of fielding them and, and divvying them out. If she can't answer, she'll get yeah. one of us to answer the question. All right, sounds good. And with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation today. I mean, it was really, it's really a fantastic program, and so timely with, you know, with the the the, the issue of the resettlement of all of all of the refugees that came from from Syria, but all the lessons learned that can help all of our organizations welcome newcomers from all over the world and help them navigate our our rather complex healthcare system as it can be sometimes. Um, so we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11. So thanks again for coming today. Uh, we don't. This is our last webinar uh, for the holiday season, um, but we do always record our webinars. So uh, during the next few weeks, while we uh, don't have any new live webinars, you're welcome to go to the Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org and watch any of the uh, past recordings uh, that we've made uh, available uh, on that website. Um, we'll be back, of course, in the new year. January 17th will be our first episode for 2018. Uh, we know the topic will be uh, from our CAFC uh, Community of Practice on Children's Pain, and more details specifically on that session will be announced in our email newsletter next Tuesday. Uh, so thanks again for joining us today. We wish everyone a happy and healthy holiday season, and uh, hopefully we'll see everyone back here in the new year. Bye.